Hi everyone, this is Miki Tsusaka, BCG's Chief Alumni Officer. I'm based in Tokyo, Japan, and I'm very, very excited to be recording this next episode of BCG Alumni Leaders. Today, I'm really excited to be talking to Ankur Vora. Ankur was in Chicago from 2003 to 2009. He graduated as a principal from BCG and was a director of programs at the Children's Investment Fund Foundation in London. He then graduated from there to join the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which we all know, in 2013 and has been leading the strategy team there and currently is now their chief strategy officer, a principal advisor to the co-chairs and executive leadership team as well. So today we'll be chatting about Ankur's path, leading with integrity, what shaped his purpose and what he's doing and some career advice for all of us. So with that, Ankur, over thank to you. you. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, um, a pleasure. So maybe we could just start uh, by just telling us a little bit about your current role and how you follow your passion for leading with integrity and purpose and uh, how you how you are where you are today. Great. Um, um, so interestingly and not surprisingly, uh, BCG was an important stop uh, for me on my path uh, to social impact and the role I have at the Gates Foundation today. <clears throat> My story goes back a long way. It's it's in the formative years, uh, which is where the leading with purpose comes from. I grew up in Gujarat, India, where my par parents run and still do run a health NGO. They had um, nice, comfortable lives in New York in the 70s and decided with a bunch of their friends to move back to India, a commute that most people don't do. And they did it because they wanted to just uh, dedicate their lives to a cause which was bigger than themselves. And so you grew up in an environment like that, and it's hard mm -hmm. um, for some of those things not to rub off. So that's where the, the origin story is. Um, <laughs> right. I wanted to do something different than my parents because that's what we all do. And, um, <laughs> they, and I, you know, India was going through economic reform and I saw the value and the power of that. It, you know, mm -hmm saving one life versus actually masses of lives and getting them out of poverty through economic reform was just a powerful lever. And so I decided to get my PhD in economics and be a development economist with the idea of working through governments to drive change. And then I grew up a little bit and I realized, and as anybody who knows me knows, um, I'm not made out to work with governments um, <laughs> as a full-time person. And so, um, so one of my professors gave me a really good set of advice and said, why don't you figure out what your value addition to the world is going to be if you want to work in social impact? And it quickly led me to saying, I want to learn what works in the private sector and bring that back to the work that I'm going to do in the social impact sector. And very quickly, uh, that answer led me to BCG. There's no better place to, you know, to get exposed to an amazing array of, uh, of sort of experiences and to see how decision-making works. And so uh, that brought me to BCG. I thought I was going to be there for two years, six years later, you know. They're pulled it. <laughs> yeah, it was a story that I think so is very common. Um, and it was this life-changing project where I got to go to India and work on uh, with a great BCG team over there to reduce corruption in one of the big social safety net programs in India. And that was the kick I needed to go back and say, okay, I need to go back to uh, the social impact. Mm -hmm. Fast forward 10 years, I am now a chief strategy officer at the Gates Foundation. And the thing that I love about telling people in this audience about that is that I think so most people will understand what that role is. Um, when I say chief strategy officer to other people, most often eyes glaze over and people are starting to think like, what does that mean? What does this person do? And, but right. like, people on this call know that, you know, Gates Foundation has big ambitions. It's a large philanthropy, but our, but we're still a small drop in the bucket compared to uh, the needs of the world. And so we often have to ask the hard questions about where do our resources make the most uh, sense to deploy? What is our pathway to impact? How do we make sure that we're actually delivering on our promise when we don't have beneficiaries and and customers that vote with their wallet and tell us whether we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing? And mm -hmm. That's my job and a uh, mm -hmm. dream job um, to, uh, to, you know, address the challenges of our time and do it with a mixture of head and heart. 
Well, that's a great point maybe to just dig a, a bit deeper on core. Um, there are understandably so many competing priorities in the world and so many places where the foundation can spend time, resources, energy. Um, you know, you bring the world's attention to the things you invest in and spend time. But how do you see that evolving with the many, many priorities you have ahead? How do you set the priorities and what are the next set of things that you're passionate about for the foundation? Passionate about is a long list. Um, in terms of what we we'll do, is probably a short list. Priorities, amongst priorities. The, um, the let me step back a little bit. I think so. The fundamentally, when we decided, um, when the Gates Foundation decided, Bill and Melinda decided what they wanted to focus on the world. I think so. They looked at it a way that um, any normal business would look at this, which is, what are the areas where the burden of inequity is the largest? What are the places where philanthropy could play a role in actually doing something about it. And we identified a bunch of those areas and they ended up becoming health inequities. It was uh, poverty reduction and it was education. And there are multiple things underneath that. And we made a call that these are issues that are not gonna be solved in the near future. And so we were committed for a very, very long time. And we've made progress on these things less than, you know, Five million children still die under the age of before their first, fifth birthday, but that number is half of what it used to be 20 years back. 10% of the world's population is still below the poverty line, but that's, it used to be a third of the world's population 30 years back. And so we made a lot of progress, but there's still a lot more to be done. And so the core is going to be to continue till we actually keep on making more of a dent. Having said that, as you said, we all there are there are newer and newer challenges. There are new things to do, and so if you look at what we've done over the course of the last, call it four or five years, we've started focusing on climate adaptation a lot more than we used to. <clears throat> Gender equality um, has become a very very large part of our organization. We we're focused on economic mobility in the U.S., which we weren't. We were focused on education, but not on economic mobility. We're doing a lot more in education globally. With COVID, a whole bunch of new things have come up. We, we would have never imagined we're focused on economic recovery conversations, but the economic recovery in the world has been so inequitable that yes. we are focusing on that. So we are focusing on a few more things, but I think the core message is we're still going to go back to our competitive advantage and where the burden is, and the core is likely going to be the same as it was five years back. Great. Well, thank you for that explanation and the uh, enormity of the challenges ahead, but the great progress that you've contributed to making. Um, let me pivot a little bit now to you as a leader. I think all of us that lead organizations, big and small, face challenges. I wonder if you just reflect back what might be those learnings in terms of your main challenges that you faced as a leader and how you overcame them that you might want to share with the audience. Great. Um, I'll if you had challenges maybe <laughs> uh yes the last <clears throat> if anybody says they haven't had challenges in the last few years um don't trust them but <laughs> i think the anybody who knows me i am a glass half full person i lead with optimism i see progress in the world and that's sort of what drives me and that's sort of the the values of the gates foundation also we lead with optimism mm -hmm. we lead with the belief that we can make the world better and the world is getting better and that's sort of fuels each other and um it's been great but the as everybody knows the last two three years have been quite hard mm -hmm. everything yes. that we believed in took a hit every issue that i talked about in terms of education or health equity or gender equality or poverty reduction and that has been hard for an organization that fuels itself of optimism to see that and so um, that was probably the biggest thing that we struggled with or I struggled with, which is how do you keep the engines running, people motivated to do the same stuff that they were doing in the face of such massive adversity? <clears throat> um, we ended up sort of, if I distill it down, two things come to mind. One was just pivoting to action. And so we spent a little bit of time struggling with what was happening in the world. And then we said, okay, enough is enough. We're going to now go and do something about it. And 
like never before. We got into this crisis fighting mode, cross-foundational leaders got together, Bill and Melinda were spearheading it. And we just went into what can we do about this? And we came up with a bunch of ideas where we thought there were gaps in the world where we had a role to play. Bill and Melinda were generous. They committed additional $2 billion to this. And we, we just went into action. And that sort of kicked us out of the some of the challenge in the past. So that was one. The other one was taking something that was a little bit of a challenge and turning it over its head. And <laughs> the, the conversation in the foundation changed from, you know, we're not making progress uh, to saying, if we don't do anything right now, we are going to, the world is going to, and we being the, not the Gates Foundation, but the global world, we, if we're not going to do anything at this moment in time, the world's just not going to, the world's going to be in a much worse off place. And so if there was any moment in time when we all had to just buckle up and do the best we could, this is the moment in time. This is the moment where we were all almost destined to dedicate our lives towards. And so this is a moment. And so we turned uh, something that was a challenge on its head. And um, so those are the two things. Right, right, right. So glass half full, take action, take charge, keep going. I like that very much. Um, you've also uh, mentioned already the challenges the world faces in terms of gender diversity, but I wonder uh, your personal views here on how organizations can help make that step change towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. I haven't met a CEO yet that says, yep, I'm done. You know, I don't think any of us feel like we're there yet, but I think leading leaders like you and organizations like you have a big role to play. But what are, what are your thoughts there? It's a great question. And it's, um, as, as you said, there's not a single CEO in the world. There's not a single leader in this world who's not thinking about this right now. Um, I think I go back to the answer is going to be uh, slightly dependent to the DNA of the organization, the incentive structures of the organization, the values of the organization. And I think so organizations need to respond to that and then figure out what the right solution for them is. There is a global good and a global need for this but i think so the how organizations evolve mm. it's going to be different and so if i take our example <clears throat> we for us every life uh deserves to live a productive and happy life and so that's that's in our mission statement that's in our vision statement and so we lead lead with a moral imperative that this is a right mm. to do and so for us our values lead us there having said yes. that we're also a very, very bottom line driven organization. Our bottom line is the number of lives saved or the number of people who are out of poverty. And we are a very, very analytical organization. And so the next step for us was to say, the model imperative, good. Now let's go back to the business and say, where does this help us drive more impact? Where does this help us drive and deliver on our outcomes in a better manner? And so we did a lot of analysis to on different parts of our business to understand where this made sense. And I think so some of the answers are ones that everybody's come up with, which is diverse teams um, actually drive better outcomes. They, they're more creative, they help with decision-making. Um, and so yeah. that became a no-brainer. And we said, okay, we're gonna do something about that, which I, I know BCG is doing, everybody else in the world is doing. We also started looking at our partners and we said, we are nothing without them um, Yes, because we're a funding agency. We work through our partners. And so having partners who are strong, having partners who are proximal to the beneficiaries or to the ground where the work needs to happen, if they are there, they will understand the context of the problem much better. They will think of more solutions that are more customized to the situation. There'll be a higher sustainability of the work that happens. And so... Yes. Yeah. We decided we needed to shift our partnership strategy in terms of who we partner with, how we invest in them. And that has become a big pillar of our uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And so we needed to do that. And then we did what I think so I'm hoping everybody in the world is doing, which is you. Once you identify why it makes sense and you understand where you need to do something, then you go and you set big, hairy, audacious goals. You public commitments, you set up a measurement framework, you um, and you hold leaders accountable. And I think we're doing all of them. Um, so 
that's where we are. My team's spending, I have multiple teams working on this issue to try and figure out how the foundation can be better at who we partner with, how we bring a better lens of diversity, equity, inclusion in all of our work. It's almost like a segmentation mm -hmm. strategy. And so, uh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, that's where we are. No. Thank you very much for sharing that. I like this notion of starting at the core of who you are, but then spreading the word and the principles and the advocacy to your partnership ecosystem around you. So thank you. So my final question, I'm sorry, the time oh. is just zoomed by. The final question I always ask is, what's the best piece of career advice you've received so far? <clears throat> yeah, fight for the things you believe in. Um, it's been a constant theme. Um, you know, have a set of things that you really believe in and just go for mm -hmm. it. Take risks, go for it. Um, it's, um, as I said right at the beginning, I saw this first time with my parents uh, making choices yeah. that I think so most people thought were crazy, but they had a belief that, you know, they wanted to do something. They had a North Star that was meaningful to them. And so they went after it. And, um, you know, it's worked out for them. And so that's been the root of the advice and that advice has come in many, many different forms and at different points in time. When I was at BCG, there were there were a few inflection points, like the product that changed my life. It meant me leaving sort of my pathway that I had in Chicago to go on a different pathway. And it changed my probability of success in terms of what I was going to do in later life. But, you know, that advice was there and there were good well-wishers who said, no, you got to do, take some risks and fight for the things you believe in. And so, that's what's helped me, and I'm hoping um, people follow their dreams. Thank you, Ankur. Thank you for fighting for what you believe in every day and going forward as well and spending your time with us. This was fantastic. It was great to hear your stories. I'm sure the audience will enjoy it as well. So please um, join us again for next month's episode. But for now, thank you very much, Ankur, for sharing your stories from Seattle today. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Mickey. Bye-bye.